Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Um, now, we might have a few late stragglers because we had a few people registered for today. So uh, I won't wait, but uh, I might just slow down as I introduce uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So as I said, Ricky is my name, uh, or I might not have said that actually, but Ricky is my name and I'm from Business Station. I'm a digital advisor at Business Station. Uh, a little bit about me, if you want to know that. Uh, I've been a freelance uh, digital developer for about 15 years. Um, prior to that, though, I had a career. I'm based in North Queensland, if you need to know that. But prior to that, I had a corporate career, uh, another career, if you like, in Sydney. And most of that was around selling business development. Um, so I've been involved in some uh, bid teams. I've ran bid teams. Uh, and I've worked for some of Australia's largest organizations, primarily IT and telecommunications. So hopefully with that sort of insight and uh, with the experience I've got with digital marketing, I can hopefully shed some light or give you a little bit of knowledge into how you might be able to improve your prospects in terms of uh, selling to business. So, just talk about, uh, briefly show you what we'll talk about today. So I'll, I'll briefly provide an overview, I, I guess, of what B2B sales is. And then we'll talk about the importance of having an online presence and how you can use that along with a range of other tactics to attract prospects and hopefully increase business. Uh, we'll also talk about some other tools you can use in terms of advertising uh, and getting to decision makers and finally, we'll finish off with a few apps that you might want to also consider, like e-commerce, for example, uh, or uh, tools that might be able to make your life a little bit easier in terms of proposals and just staying in touch with potential prospects and clients. Okay, so the whole idea, though, of today is to sort of avoid this scenario where you put a bid or a quote into a, 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 a you know, a potential client and you get this response, not knowing, of course, but, uh, you know, as we all know, the importance of a relationship in a B2B situation is, is critical. You know, most businesses that win contracts already have a relationship with the buyer and the business. So it is very, very important, less important than say the less important in the, in the consumer market than it is in the B2B market. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it's important in the B2C market as well. But let's just, now that I've mentioned that, let's just talk about the, you know, what makes the B2B market sort of unique and different from say, selling to consumers. So the first thing you need to keep in mind is that there's multiple decision makers. Now, depending on your customer, you know, it could be a single person operation still, or it could be a, a large, you know, government department or something like that. So in some cases, you're gonna have multiple decision makers or you know, it's what we used to call a strategic sales opportunity, basically where you've got multiple decision makers you need to influence. So that could be the boss, it could be the chief operating officer, it could be some technical specialist that you need to influence or gatekeepers and other influences. So there's a range of different people as opposed to say consumer marketing, there's often just one or maybe two decision makers. Now, because of the multiple decision makers, but also because of the technical sale in some cases, or uh, just the, the, the nature of B2B selling, the sales cycle is often much longer. So it could be a month or three months, a year, depending on the complexity and the, the value of the, the uh, contract in most cases. And from a business's perspective, they're looking at a stronger relationship with their suppliers than say, a consumer would you know they're looking to really build a deep relationship with that vendor or provider or supplier over that given period of the contract and and potentially longer and in most cases a business customer is going to want to know more about your product than say a consumer product and that's because you know in some cases they're going to need to support it they need to understand how to integrate it into their existing systems so it's a much more complex uh, sales process. In some cases, once again, it depends on your particular product. And of course, it's not a spontaneous sale. So you can't, 
you know, often advertise on Facebook, for example, and hope that someone's going to like your your ad and click on the button and buy your product. It's often not like that because it's it's a considered cautious approach because there's multiple decision makers. It affects the wider business. So they need to be a little bit more considered when they decide on a purchase. So with that in mind, you know, you need to think about depending on where your business customers are in terms of their journey with you or with their particular problem solving, uh, you know, where they are in their journey and therefore what sort of information they're looking for. Um, so for example, you know, if your customers at the very beginning of their sales cycle, it's often trying to identify what their problem is. So this is where you need to, as a business, show your thought leadership, basically, show your leadership in this particular area. And you can do this in a number of ways. And there's some examples there. It could be, you know, just basic education of the customer, how-to guides or case studies on how other people are solving this particular problem, you know, different trends and industry benchmarks or promoting something that an analyst might have talked about, for example. Um, the next stage would be, you know, how do they then start to, uh, you know, they've identified the problem, how do they then fix that problem? So they'd start to look for, you know, solutions and products that would be suitable to fix their particular problem. So, you know, this is where you're talking about, you know, how to choose a particular vendor or how your solution works versus other solutions, for example, uh, how to identify, you know, bad solutions versus good solutions. Um, so a range of different things there. And then finally, when they're ready to make a decision, they're looking for you to prove your cred credentials, essentially. And um, this is where you might talk about your pricing. You could talk about case studies, testimonials, for example, return on investment case studies, you know, how to buy, you know, if it's a complex product, for example, you know, a range of different things. So, uh, you know, you might want to think of this, for example, as a sales funnel, and we'll talk about a sales funnel shortly. But the key to, so if with that in mind, that what I've just spoken about, the key to selling to business is really being able to provide a range of different uh, relevant information to different people, depending on where they are in the sales cycle. So the solution to this is to use what's known as inbound marketing. So it's a combination of different types of content marketing. And you might be using email, you might be using social media, you might be using SEO or search engine optimization, it could be digital advertising of different forms, search advertising, uh, Facebook advertising, LinkedIn advertising, for example. As opposed to what people might do traditionally. So this would be maybe, you know, going to trade shows, cold calling, doing some print advertising, mail drops, networking events, that sort of thing. So traditionally, this has been where a lot of organizations have spent, you know, something in the order of 80% of their time and resources, and maybe 20% in the other area, the inbound marketing, digital marketing. So, and the experts are saying it should be the reverse of this. So 80% of your, your budget and resources should be spent on content marketing, and 20% should be spent on these other, um, other outbound marketing opportunities, if you like that are still important, but maybe less so than uh, the inbound marketing opportunities. So going back to, remember I talked about the funnel, if you think about you know, the, your customers and where they are in their sales cycle and therefore what they're trying to, you know, what information they're seeking. You know, when they're at that information seeking level, you know, trying to identify what their problem is, you could think of them above the funnel. And really what you wanna do is, attract them into that sales funnel where they then become a lead. And there's a number of ways you can do that. So you might have say an ad, it could be a Google ad, could be a Facebook ad or a LinkedIn ad. They click on that ad, it takes them to a landing page. Now, once they're on that landing page, you want them to do a couple of things. It might be a range of different call to action. So the very worst case scenario, well, there's a range of different things. It could be going right through to the funnel and actually purchasing your product. And that's an unlikely scenario, but it could happen. Uh, the second scenario is to leave their email address in some way, shape or form. Uh, you could offer some sort of information in exchange for their email address. 
Um, it could be to subscribe to your newsletter, for example. Um, so that's the second call to action. And third or worst case scenario is they leave, they've visited your website and they leave, and that's where you might start to do, say, retargeting. And that's where you start to build this funnel. So, you know, the second phase is where they're looking for, you know, how, how do I, I've identified my problem, how do I then fix that problem? And this is where you'd be sort of providing content to that middle of the funnel uh, prospect audience, if you like. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So going back to that, and just, just to refresh your memory, so if you think about, you know, the three areas I spoke about there, they're really the top and the middle and the bottom of the funnel. Uh, so you really need to identify what content you need to provide these individual types of customers. So here's an example. So top of the funnel, you might consider them, they've come into your funnel, they're a lead, they're looking for, uh, you know, some of that uh, problem identification information. So, you know, this is where you might share that information I spoke about, but some of the things you could use there would be blog posts, for example, or eBooks or white papers or infographics, explainer videos. There's a range of different things you could do. It could even be a range of emails that like a drip feeding information about particular features and benefits. But this is where the top of the funnel, this is where you, you know, you're in the game, you're posi positioning yourself as a player, if you like. Then comes the middle of the funnel. So they then become a, a prospect. And this is where, you know, you're exploring their specific needs, for example, you're sharing different types of solutions and approaches, and you're building relationships with them. So different types of content there might be things like videos or webinars, podcasts. You could even speak to them. So this is where you might offer a, you know, a one-to-one. -one. Uh, it could be online, it could be face-to-face guides and walkthroughs where you're providing us, you know, helpful content that's going to help them build a solution or come up with a, a, a short list of solutions for their particular problem. And then you've got bottom of the funnel stage. So I will go into how you might deliver all of this content at different stages, but this is where they're ready to make a decision. So, um, you know, they've They've considered all the op all the all the uh, different options out there. They've decided that potentially you're one of the uh, you know final few that they're going to decide upon, and this is where you need to just you know convince them that you're the best choice uh, or the best solution. So case studies, testimonials, um, a range of different things you could offer there. Different comparisons of solutions if you're you know confident of doing that. Uh, live demos. Uh, Meetings, once again, is also very, very important. So this is sort of what we're aiming at in terms of trying to get your users or your people that aren't necessarily aware of you through that funnel process. And like I said, it's going to be using a combination of these three, or four, sorry, four different or more different types of content marketing. So having said that, let's talk about your online presence because your online presence you really need to think of this as um, it's really like your location for want of a better description, where if you had a physical location and it was on a great intersection that got lots of traffic passing by and potentially stopping by, you know, that's really what your online presence is about. And you use tools like SEO, for example, to bring foot traffic to your, your location. So, uh, if you can think of it like that, your online presence is critically, critically important. You don't want to only be visible on certain social channels. You want to be, try and be as visible as possible across all of these channels. So that would include, you know, a website, for example, email marketing, you know, doing social media posts, both organic and or paid posts, getting yourself listed on various member directories and or business directories. There's a lot of business directories out there and this does help and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Getting yourself in online articles and that could be your own blog posts, trying to answer someone's question, trying to give them advice on solutions, but it could also be in guest posts as well. So guest posts are a great, great way to raise your online visibility through high authority 
website. So if you're ever looking for opportunities there, you just need to search for them on Google. So you'd search for something like Right For Us and then your particular industry. You might need to play with that a little bit, but you'll find a lot of articles there that are, or a lot of websites that are looking for content. Uh, in other words, guest, guest posts. So this is really a, what you need to do to build a strong online presence. The stronger your online presence, the more organic traffic you're gonna uh, attract to your website. The, therefore, the more conversions you'll make, more customers you'll, you'll generate, more business you'll generate. So now I've talked about organic, there is also the paid component, but if you think about say the e-commerce industry as a whole, uh, industry uh, research has shown that organic traffic accounts for, uh, you know, as, at least 40% of the, of the top uh, organic, uh, sorry, e-commerce websites. And in some cases, much more than that. So organic traffic should be very, very important to you. And this is one of the ways you can sort of uh, improve that and boost your online traffic. So why is your online presence important? I've sort of talked a, a little bit about it there, but also here are some sources uh, from some uh, organizations out there. So nine out of 10 B2B buyers say online content has a moderate to major effect on purchasing decisions. So they're using online content and you, of course you would, to make these decisions. So if you're not in that mix, then you're not gonna be a player and not gonna be considered. 84% of CEOs and vice presidents use social media to make purchasing decisions. So that's 84%, that's a very high level. 67% of buyers journey is now done digitally. So this is where they're doing that research. What is my problem? How can I solve my problem? Who are the different providers of solutions to that problem, you know, how can I find out more about them, et cetera. This is all done now digitally. So you need to have that long, strong online presence to ensure that you're, you're getting the eyeballs and therefore the traffic to your website. So one of the first steps in that process is of course, to have a website, but why do you need a website? You know, there's a lot of other platforms out there, but a website is critically important for a number of different things. It allows you to build brand awareness and just, you know, just show you as an example, even though this doesn't necessarily apply to that particular statement, you know, people do do research on Google. So, you know, here's a particular one here, widget supplies in Townsville, for example, you know, this might be what someone would search for. You need to make sure that you're in this, in these search results. And there's not just one search result, there's three, at least three on this particular page that you can rank on based on a search term. There's advertising, there's organic SEO results, and then there's your Google My Business or Google Profile, you know, your map, your reviews, and your Google Business Profile. So there's three areas that you can rank here, let alone shopping or images, for example, which might not be so relevant for a B2B business, but still important to, uh, to make sure that you have an online presence because you want to rank in this regard. So building a website is important because it allows you to create that brand awareness. People can discover you and find out more about what you do. It enables you to build awareness, but also build credibility. So as you know, uh, first impressions are important. So if they come across a professional website, you know, it's a big tick in the box that you've got some level of credibility there, but you can sell that even more. So what you do, you know, what your capabilities are, what your experience is, you know, what your customers say about you, some of your large customers, for example, that you've worked on, case studies. So it's all of this sort of information that you need. If you were to say to respond to an RFP or a tender, for example, this is all the information that you're going to need to provide anyway. And, and likewise for an online uh, presence. You need to have that sort of information there. So what our clients say about us, get in touch with us, get a quote, all of these sorts of things. A website is an ideal platform to do that. It's also a great platform to show your skills. So, you know, who your people are, 
this is a mock-up, it's not a real one, but uh, who your people are and why they're brilliant at what they do and, you know, therefore why your company is brilliant at what they do. It's also an excellent way to just promote your products and services. So what, you know, clearly on the homepage, you need to tell people about what you do, what you specialise in and, uh, you know, make it easy for them to find information about that. Okay, so a website's important, but there's no good having a website if you can't get that website found. And that's where SEO and keywords become really, really important. So keyword research is a really critical, important, important part of SEO. And the reason for that, hello, Guy. Um, the reason why SEO is important and keywords are important is because Google use it as the key way to understand whether a website is relevant to a particular search term. So, I mean, this quote here is an actual Google search uh, quote, a Google quote. So it is very, very important. And it is the main way that you're going to, so for example, going back to my search before widgets in Townsville, if you don't have that on your page, that content in some way, then you're not going to rank for that particular search. That sounds pretty obvious, I guess. So from an SEO point of view, uh, from B2B or any sort of SEO goal perspective, what you really need to do is a couple of things. You really need to identify and selectively, under, underline the word selectively, use a target keyword phrase. And by phrase, we're talking about a three to five word phrase. So really, this is ideally ideal situation. Identify and selectively use a target keyword phrase. You could also use some or identify some related terms and variations, synonyms, that sort of thing. But for each of those target keyword phrases, you need to identify that for each of your pieces of content that you have on your web page. So that includes every page, every service page, for example, or product page. And they need to be unique for each one of those. And then you write qu quality content around each of those keyword terms. So it sounds relatively simple and it is relatively simple, but I just wanna show you how you would then implement this say on a website. So I'm gonna show you a really simple example here, maybe not a B2B example, but a really simple example. So if I was a mechanic in Darwin, for example, Tom's mechanical, and I've decided I've gone off and done some keyword research and I've decided that car mechanic Darwin is the keyword I want to rank for. So using that as a keyword, I would then sort of develop content around that, but I would make sure that that keyword is used in a, a few places. So in the title, in the URL, in the body text of that particular page, and also in the alt image tag, it's called. Now you're not going to use it in a spammy way, you're just gonna use it in a conversational English way. And naturally, as you would talking to someone. And you would also maybe add a couple of links there. So in this particular case, I've thought, well, uh, a if you're looking for a mechanic, you might also be looking for a roadworthy certificate. So I've put that in there too, and a link to the roadworthy certificate page. And I've also added brake repair and added a link to the brake repair page. That's really simplistically, how you would optimize a page around a keyword phrase. Now you wanna have you know, a minimal number of words because this is how Google search works or Bing search works. It needs to have a certain number of words to identify really what that page is about. And therefore it can build a picture about what your business is about. And therefore when someone searches, they then can match your business to that search term. So that's why keywords are really, really important. Now, like I said before, it's not just about the search of the organic search results. It's about a, a number of different areas of the search page. And why this is important is because it's the people that are searching on Google are usually, depending on their intent, but in some cases, there's actually, well, in a lot of cases, they're searching for information about your particular products or services. So they're what you might call a qualified lead. They're inf inf interested in your product and services, and they're looking for it. 
So, you know, why not take advantage of that? So there are a number of ways you can do that. And I just want to pinpoint this out because if you can sort of, you know, like I said, there's three areas where you can rank on a Google page. And the first one is in the Google ads section. So these people are paying Google to rank for a particular search term. This one here is Google My Business or a combination of your Google business profile, your Google Maps, and your Google uh, reviews. And, you know, you really need to, whether you are only a local business or not, you should really have a, a business profile, Google My Business page, because it allows you to strengthen your SEO, do a range of other things like post to your Google My Business page, but it also, in doing that, verifies you as a business and your business address through Google My Business. Even if you don't use your business address as an actual part of your business, so you work from home, you can still do this and hide your business address. It's very, very important. And then the SEO part is down the bottom. So if I'm someone that's looking for a particular solution to my problem, and I see a business that's ranking in all three areas there, it really packs a powerful punch and says to me, well, I should at least consider those people. Even if it's not in the advertising and just in the other two sections, I think it's still a, a very powerful statement. And you can rank multiple times in the organic results. You know, you can uh, rank for a web page, you can rank for um, a blog post, you can rank for your social pages, you can also rank under citation sites. So citation sites are things like local search, true local, yellow pages, all of these ones that provide a free business listing for businesses. So just on that, uh, local marketing is important, even if you don't have a bricks and mortar store, but especially if you do and you want people to drop by your store, but even, not, even if you don't, it's still important. If you do have a business and you haven't claimed your business, uh, Google My Business profile, you should do that. You can do it in a number of ways. You can just go to Google My Business uh, it's business.google.com, uh, or you can do it this way, search for your business and then click on that own this business question and uh, it will take you through the prompts you need to, um, to claim your particular business. So that's one way to do it. And you should definitely do that and then go about optimizing your listing. So there's various things you need to do there, you know, um, add all the, the normal information you would for a, a business profile you know, opening hours, your address, but also product photos, your phone number, your website address, of course, is very, very important because that's a link back. It's a backlink, very important. Um, and yes, yeah, so include Google reviews. Now, this is really important as well because there is a type of business ad coming to Australia called service, local service ads. So if you are, say, a local service business, that provide business to business services. Uh, very soon, they're already available in North America and some parts of Europe. There will be these local service ads and they'll pop up uh, above the Google My Business page. And they're sort of guaranteed by Google. They'll offer money back guarantee. They'll also show the reviews. So if you haven't done this process yet in terms of getting a Google My Business, account, it's probably something you should do, particularly if you are offering local type services to other businesses, because sooner or later, you know, these people, these local service ads will arrive and, uh, you know, it'll be very difficult to out compete people that are advertising on that. Um, so the other thing you can do is submit your business to a range of citation sites, and this will give you a lot of, a lot of links and therefore authority in terms of SEO. So just help you in terms of raising your visibility. So uh, there are a bunch of these uh, true local, I would just search for citation sites, Australia, for example, uh, there's lists of 25 or 50, even of these, they're all legitimate businesses. They just provide two things, a business directory for people to find local businesses, but two helping online businesses by listing their business and providing, uh, it's basically providing a backlink to your site, but enabling you to rank better. So, uh, you know, really you should be aiming to try and get about 25 or so of these 
pointing to your particular business website. Now, uh, blogs are another way that you can rank really, really well for particular types of topics and keywords. So uh, they're a great way to engage an audience. They rank well because search engines see them as um, fresh content, as opposed to a web page, which is static. In most cases, mostly static anyway. So uh, they're a great way to uh, engage an audience, but also to rank for particular search phrases, particularly when you're trying to answer a question or provide a solution in maybe the form of a list of things people can do to solve a particular problem. Um, they do rank very, very well. Now I'm gonna show you an example, not a good B2B example, I know, but I didn't have time to refresh this one, but I just did a search for say best handbag. Now you could do the change handbag for anything you want, but the point, I just wanna show you this to make a point basically. So if I search for that, and it comes up with a whole bunch of lists uh, of results, including what people also asked, which is also quite useful for coming up with an idea of what you might post yourself. But just the reason I'm showing you this is every one of these results here are actually blog posts. There's no static pages here. They're all blog posts from, in most cases, glamour, you know, multinational brands. But um, just want to show you that in some instances, blog posts outrank almost everything else. So it is definitely worthwhile uh, if you're trying to answer a question, you think about top of the funnel and where they're looking for solutions. It's a great way to provide a, a you know, a, a wordy document that provides a list of ways they can fix that problem or compares different solutions. Uh, you know, and this also goes into that middle of the middle of the funnel stage too. So. Blogging is a great way to get people to your website because it's answering a question. You just want to make sure that somewhere there you've got links back to your website. So, you know, calls to action or just links within the actual blog pointing them back to your website. Okay, so that's a range of different organic things and SEO. Uh, also just touching on how you can use social media because you know, social media should be supporting your overall goal, goals, you know, whatever your objective what might be. And uh, so, for example, just if you think about that funnel process, but based on different types of research here, this one comes from Content Marketing Institute, that many B2B marketers are using their social media in one of three ways. Primarily, they're using their social media to create brand awareness. So who are you? What do you do really well? What do you stand for? But they're also using social media to educate their audiences. So what are your capabilities? What are your team skills? What projects are you working on or have worked on? Case studies, for example, maybe products and services that you offer. So this might be that middle of the funnel content. And third, would be building credibility and trust. So this is where they're deciding on who they're gonna go with. So awards, milestones, reviews, testimonials, anything that you can do to build credibility and trust in your particular brand. So if, if you think about your content schedule over any given week or month, then you should be breaking it down into potentially these three areas Plus, you know, you might have other areas you want to address, but potentially these three areas should, uh, you know, take a big chunk of your resources in terms of what, what content you're putting out there. And, you know, you need to be regularly, consistently posting to social channels and the right social channels where your audience is going to be found. And I can't speak for your particular audiences, but, you know, these are some of the more traditional ones you might find audiences on. And not to forget that your blog post is also a form of, if you like, a social channel. So, uh, you know, there are platforms around such as Buffer, and there's a few other ones out there that are sh post schedulers. They'll schedule posts to your social platforms, and that can include your blog post. That can include, if it depends, but say WordPress blog posts in most cases, but it can also be, um, 
say your Google My Business page or lots of your other social media channels like Facebook and LinkedIn. So it might be worth considering one of these. Buffer has a free plan for up to three social profiles. So if you only have three of those profiles that you want to send content out to, it might be Google My Business, LinkedIn, and Facebook, for example, then Buffer's a good choice for you to at least get started and start to build that, that content. Your blog post also, you can promote your blog posts through these social channels as well. Okay, so uh, just touching on advertising now. So we've mostly talked about organic, how to get traffic to your website in all, uh, an organic way, but there's also ways to get traffic to your site by paying for that particular traffic. So, and sometimes you might want to do both. And in a lot of cases you, you should be doing both because creating awareness is one of those things you should always be doing, even if you have a minimal budget just about trying to get people into that funnel. Now, the rest of the funnel you can take care of through things like email marketing and that sort of thing, but you wanna try and get people into, um, into that funnel on a consistent, regular basis. Now, from an advertising perspective, there's different types of advertising platforms, of course, and they all have their place and the position. So Facebook, for example, or Instagram is great if you're trying to sell primarily to consumers, but also keep in mind that many of your business customers are also spending time on there as consumers in inverted commas. So it is a good way to also influence them um, or influence people that may be influencers within that business account. So it's not something to, prom to necessarily forget if you're not selling to consumers. And Google is fantastic if you wanna sell to both consumers and business where you are primarily going to be searched for, you know, so where your service or product or brand, brand is important because people search for brands. So if you sell a particular brand, then, you know, that's a searchable term. Um, but, you know, there are also different differences between them. And we'll talk about that in a sec. And then of course, you've got LinkedIn, which is fantastic if you want to directly target businesses and government organizations, for example. So let's just briefly look at these two. So this one's a little bit dated because it's not even called Google AdWords anymore. It's good, just called Google Ads. Uh, now, the, the main differences between the two of them is I really think that one is where one's searching for a product. So there's some sort of intent there. Whereas with social or Facebook, it's more about um, almost like a spontaneous thing based on their likes or personalities or preferences, they may, they'll see your ad potentially and therefore maybe buy your product. Whereas with search ads, they're actually actively searching for your product. So that's the, the primary, primary difference between the two of them. Now there's also LinkedIn. Now LinkedIn sort of does a combination of the two of these. It does you know, both forms of that sort of advertising. Uh, it's fantastic though, if you want to do specific targeting by job title, by company, by industry type, for example. And the reason why you might wanna do that is because of these stats. So four out of five LinkedIn members are decision makers. So, uh, you know, it's, you can start to connect to those people right away as soon as you have your LinkedIn account. And they have twice the buying power of your average web audience. And that's because they are decision makers in their own right. Now, within LinkedIn advertising, you can do a couple, you know, a range of different types of advertising, but you can also target specific, specifically based on company, you know, so what company they are, what industry they are, for example, and decision makers within that, for example, or it could be based on your own contacts, your own lists, for example. Finally, it could be retargeting people that have visited your website and or your LinkedIn page. So you would then target them on other websites, for example, and very much like Google retargeting does exactly the same. So just show you a little bit about uh, 
linked in here. If you haven't visited this page, maybe it's worthwhile. And it is the best way to target individual business decision makers. Having said that, they're not going to be as engaged as they are on Insta or on Facebook or anything like that because they're busy working, you know. So there's three types of con uh, ways of advertising, really. There's sponsored content, which is basically an ad within your Instagram feed. But uniquely, you can do these sponsored emails. So these are in -mail emails that are or messages that are spent, sent to their inbox, both email inbox, reminding them that there's a message for them. And you can also do text ads. So it's a fantastic way to really get to individual decision makers. And even though people know those sponsored ads, even the inbox ads are ads, if, they're, if it's relevant to them, they'll still reply because they know that you know, there's a person behind that particular or a business behind that particular um, inbox message. So a little bit more about this. So I just want to show you this, some of the things you can do here. So it's relatively easy to do. Um, I was just going to pause that, but I'll just keep this going. This is a recording, screen recording. Visit this page because there's a lot of things that you can do here, a lot of different information, and they make it very easy to advertise. You can see you just choose it's all based on your objective, pretty much like the other platforms, but they make it easier in a way. So are you trying to create awareness, top of the funnel, consideration, middle of the funnel, conversion, bottom of the funnel, and different types of ads for each of those ones. And what are you trying to achieve? So is it engagement or website traffic, et cetera. So uh, based on that, you know, you can choose the different types of LinkedIn ads that are available. There's a lot of different ads available here. Conversational type messenger ads, carousel ads, you know, you can see down here, lead forms. Try just follower ads where you try to build your popularity and your followers. Or just single image job ads, depending on what your objective is. So I would definitely uh recommend that uh, if you haven't done this already have a look around the linkedin website and see all the opportunities there are for your particular business and your particular products for example now there is also a tool called sales navigator now this is you have to pay for this but this is where you know it's really like a, a account sales tool where you can find opportunities uh so, CRM of one, for want of a better description, and you can build opportunities and hopefully generate business this way. Um, so once again, have a have a visit of the LinkedIn website and see what you uh, what you think about that particular tool. It might or might not suit where you are. There's a little bit more here. I'll just show you about this too. So this is the LinkedIn sales solutions page and it talks about the sales navigator and, you know, depending on, you know, what sort of persona you are and compares the pricing there too. So, you know, it's a fantastic way to, you know, really connect. I've done this myself and it does definitely work. I've worked on client campaigns that does the same. So uh, from both fronts, I can tell you that it works very, very well. And the more personalized you can make it, the better in terms of when you're doing these reach out types, type inbox uh, campaigns. So yeah, definitely have a visit there. So there are different pricing models. And uh, I think here I've got some pricing there. So I think this is in US dollars. I, I would urge you to maybe check this yourself. So you wanna make sure of course that before you do this, you're going to get the return on your investment. So you'd probably build your LinkedIn profile, you know, maybe fix any issues you might have on your website in terms of, you know, calls to action, content on your homepage, all these sorts of things. Uh, but definitely look at, at this if it's of something of interest to you. They have annual and monthly plans. So even if you just use it monthly to trial it and see if it's something that's uh, good for you or not. Now, I did mention retargeting visitors. So this is where someone's come to your website and looked at something on your website and you then retarget them on another website. 
So, uh, you know, we've all probably experienced this where you've looked at a product and then suddenly you're seeing it advertised on another product platform. And it's really easily done through cookies and pixels and things like that. So uh, this is something you can do through all of these platforms. Uh, and it might be something that you want to consider because this is where, you know, if you think about that funnel again, once they leave your website, are you ever going to see them again? So this is a great opportunity for, if you think about that foot traffic, you don't have necessarily the people walking past your store. So when they come in, grab their email address. If you can't do that, or if they haven't subscribed to something, then, you know, this is your fallback position to retarget them in another way. Now, I'm just going to talk about email marketing as well. Email marketing is another, if you like, organic channel that you can use. It's a fantastic channel to use because it's going to provide you, uh, potentially, uh, depending on your particular product, again, one of the best in terms of return on investment of all of your marketing uh, channels. So there are different marketing tools available. I'll just touch on them briefly here you know, depending on what you want to do. So, you know, MailerLite, for example, is a good platform if you're just starting off because it has all the features, but it's free until you get to, I think, 2,000 subscribers. So it's, you know, pretty much free for a lot of startup organizations. Send in Blue also has a good startup plan, but also has a little CRM. So for managing your clients, for example, as some of the other ones do, it's not unique in that regard. Get response is fantastic, but a little bit more expensive, uh, but it has sort of some of these pre-built lead generation funnels in there. And all you have to do is fill in the blanks if you like. So uh, it's sort of like the Rolls Royce. But once again, you're talking, you know, mailer lights free, potentially depending on the size of your list versus get response, which might cost you 50 plus US dollars a month. So that's sort of the differential there. Um, now, a lot of people will use MailChimp because it also is free, uh, integrates with everything. Um, so I, I'll just show you this as an example. So MailChimp is a good example of what these ones offer. It's like the original email marketing platform. And just show you because I'm just going to stop it there. So they don't just do newsletters anymore, these email marketing platforms. They're really sophisticated tools. They do, uh, you can build landing pages with them now. As you can see here, you can do appointment scheduling, but there's a range of different automation tools that you can use as well. So you can do email, of course, landing pages, ads from within the platform. Um, you can manage your client list, segment it into smaller groups. So you can do more personalized email marketing to them. And then you do some Automation. So automations would be things that you might, ne might necessarily have to do manually, but this would do it automatically for you. So just to give you an idea of the pricing here, so depending on your list size, how much it would cost you in Australian dollars. And as you can see there, the, the free one's not too bad. You know, it gives you most things that you would need to get started. So yeah, you might want to investigate but I do recommend if you're not doing email marketing to start, you know, sooner rather than later, because it's all about building a list. And the sooner you can start building a list, the better. And some of the reasons why you might want to use email marketing is because of some of these things. So it will provide, if you do it right, and you've got a, a sort of a critical mass of subscribers, it'll provide the highest return on investment of any of your marketing channels. And that's because those people have already, those prospects, if you like, have subscribed. They've already got some skin in the game. They've subscribed to your list. They're obviously interested. Therefore, uh, they're more likely to be more engaged with what you've got to say. Um, also, you know, according to HubSpot, which is a leading marketing platform, it's 40 times more effective than Twitter and Facebook marketing combined. Now, one of the reasons why it's so effective is that you can do what's called segmentation. So you can get an email list and you can segment it into real personalized groups. So you can do individual personalized marketing to those groups. So this becomes really important. Once again, if you think about where your customers are in their journey, 
You don't want to do this scatter or like a shotgun approach with a newsletter, hoping that everyone's going to be interested in it when you might really want to be better off. And nothing wrong with the newsletter because they are good. But you also want to make sure that you're sending people the relevant information they're wanting at the right time. So, uh, you know, you can do that through segmentation and through automation. So uh, segments can be based on a huge range of different criteria. And I'll just show you that quickly using this, in this particular case, I'm showing you Clavio. Um, but Clavio will uh, gives you, a, a you know, your particular list that you've got already. But I just want to show you how you can create a list and how that might be relevant to what you're doing. So if, I'm just going to click on there and create a segment rather. So a segment is a cut down or a group, subgroup within a list. And uh, I'm just gonna show you, make up a test one here. Now, most of the sophisticated email marketing platforms allow you to do this. and allows you to define who's gonna be on this list. So in this particular case, you can choose a whole bunch of different things, but I'm gonna choose what someone has or hasn't done, the top one there. So, and I can then choose a metric. So what they might've done with my emails, for example, open them or not open them, or maybe a product they viewed or not viewed or a form. But in this case, I'm gonna choose, it's a Shopify site. I'm gonna choose something they've done on the site. So in this particular case, a product that they've ordered. So now I've created a list where everyone that's ordered this product at least a few times, in this case, I'm gonna say three times, is gonna go onto this list. So every time someone orders a product for the third time, they'll be added to this list automatically. And then you can, you know, so I can specify which particular product or whatever I want. So if I choose product ID here, for example, I could choose that particular product. And then therefore everyone on this list that's ordered that particular product three times, I can then do very specific marketing to them. They're frequent buyers of this particular product and therefore my content will be based around this particular product, for example, or maybe some product that complements that or what other people might have bought in the past that also bought that product, for example. So that's how you might create a segment. I'm just gonna move on from here because all I really do is make that segment a little bit more specialized or niche. So once you've created your segments, you can then create some automations around those segments. So automations are really, depending on your email platform, some, some people call them flows or journeys or automations. And automations are just about uh, automating your marketing, uh, your email marketing, but your customer service as well. So, you know, it could be based on a range of three things, essentially. Three triggers would, be, would, would trigger an automation. One of them might be based on what one of your users did for example so based on their behavior on your website so in this particular case you know you've all probably heard of the abandoned cart email so that's when someone abandons a cart and then you then automatically send them an email reminding them that they've abandoned the cart so uh, that's one trigger for example but it could be based on all sorts of different behaviors another one might be based on a particular segment they're in like the one i just showed you there so all these particular users that have bought this particular product, for example, um, or some dem demographic it could be, or it could be geography or some other thing like that. Um, thirdly, it could be based on date. So if you have a product that requires uh, refilling, restocking, um, or you know, replenishing of some sort, then you can organize a automated date-based trigger after a certain number of days, an email is sent to them, reminding them to refill or to restock um, their particular product. So email marketing is a fantastic tool to help you fill that gap uh, in terms of talking to the, the customer, uh, you know, without having to necessarily do that manually, uh, you know, with limited resources and limited time. So I'll just show you that from a, so this is MailChimp. This is what MailChimp show, uh, offers in terms of their inbuilt workflows, they call them. Um, so these are the automations I just spoke about. So a welcome message, you know, everyone should have a welcome message. So this is when they've subscribed to your list, whatever that list might be. 
Um, you should have that as number one. And number two, if you do sell products to business and you have a shopping cart, then maybe a uh, a uh, abandoned cart email would also be a useful one as well. But there's a range of different ones there that you can easily pull up and use instantly. So that's email marketing. And uh, once again, recommend highly that you get that started if you haven't, so you can start building that list. And the way you build that list, by the way, is having uh, you ask them wherever possible to join that list. So you have a big call to action in the middle of your page saying, subscribe to our list, whatever that list is, so that you can get this benefit and this benefit. Because it shouldn't just be necessarily about join our newsletter. You know, you should really try and sell that to them and give them some reason to, to sign up so you get a lot of subscribers. Okay, so a couple of other things I'm just going to briefly talk about because we're almost out of time here. So uh, just things that might make your job a little bit easier and maybe you haven't seen them or have seen them. But there's a lot of proposal apps out there now that you can use. Proposify is one of them, for example, uh, but there are also other ones available. Um, just... Yeah, this... Sorry, that's meant to be a video, but it's not working. But there is Proposify. There's also Panda Docs, same sort of thing. You can go and visit them, and they have proposal apps across all different types of industries. Uh, some are better than others, and uh, there's also better proposals as well that some people use, which is a bit more fancy. So there's three that you might want to look at if you're doing proposal after proposal after proposal. This can save a lot of time and effort. Um, in that you can reuse those proposals uh, on other ones. So you might want to visit those at some point. Also, some things you might want to consider are tools that just help you manage your day-to-day -day business in terms of your processes. You, you know, because if you think about the core of marketing now, the seven Ps, it used to be four Ps, your product, your pricing, your place, your promotion, they now include things like process. So there's the seven Ps now, uh, your process and your people. Uh, so for example, and proof of course, or your physical evidence. But So this will help in terms of how do you onboard clients? How do you manage your particular business? So some of these tools are very, very good. There's monday.com, there's Asana, which we actually use in-house, uh, ClickUp, range of different tools that and what they basically do, they're a way of integrating all the other tools that you use. It might be email or different other tools that you use. So you're not going to different platforms all the time. Um, and also just help you collaborate with your team and or your clients. So quite useful tools there. I haven't touched on e-commerce really, um, but e-commerce of course is really, really, really important. I and mean, it's often thought of as a business to consumer type of solution. But I'm a strong believer in that you can also use it in a B2B uh, environment as well. It's an ideal situation for all sorts of different types of products and services. And it doesn't really matter what types of products and services that you have. You can offer different pricing to different types of client types. You can have wholesale clients, for example, versus retail clients and offer different rates to them. And it's also ideal for all types of products, you know, whether you're selling physical products or service-based products, whether it's a physical product or a virtual product or a retail or a wholesale product, you know, e-commerce, there's a solution there for you. Some are better than others. For example, if you're looking at a wholesale solution, you might want to do some research there because, you know, something like WordPress might be a better solution for you than say Shopify, just as an example, not necessarily need to discount Shopify, but I'm just saying there are better solutions than others if you're looking at e-commerce from that perspective. Now, that's basically it for today for me. I hope you got something out of that. I'm just going to stop there. Um, if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them. If not, uh, you're welcome to grab my email address there, Ricky at Business Station, and you can shoot me an email if you need to, if you have any questions or if you'd like any 
information about some of the things I talked about today. Um, but like I said, hopefully you got some value out of that. Um, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone that uh, was part of today. Um, yep, so all of you people there, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, like I said, I do welcome emails. I do like to uh, you know help people out as much as I can. So uh, hopefully you got something out of it. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. How to access the recording? Well, you should receive everyone. If you, you should receive a link, an email with the link to this recording. Now, if you don't, please let us know because that means that our process is broken down. But you should definitely get a, a link to the particular recording. Um, yes, I can send the. PowerPoint slides. The problem is because I have a lot of screen recordings in there, it tends to be a really big file. Like we're talking 500 megabyte plus. So I can definitely, what I'll do is if you can just leave it with me, I'll send you a link. I know every, everyone that was on board today and I can send you a link to the presentation if you're interested in, in downloading that. So hopefully that, that adds. And so is that Sian or is that an I? How do you pronounce your name, Sian? Is that like a Siobhan Irish name? No. Anyway, I will send you that the slides. Sian, thank you, Sian. I'll send you the slides and all of the other people that were attended, as well as all the other people. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone.